so tonight we're going to talk God willing we will impart and and yeah we're just going to talk about relationships tonight's message is called hashtag relationship goals <laughs> so let's get started <laughs> so as we had this conversation we were in the car and, then, and we got home and a lot of the questions during the panel were clearly about relationships in terms of couples and uh, married couples, engaged couples. It was a, just an amazing panel. And, and as we talked later on, we realized, you know, a lot of the questions at the time were based on, well, you know, how do you make this relationship that you have work, whatever stage it, that it's in. And as we, as we discussed and we got further and further into it, we realized that before we even get into the relationship with another person, there, there are tiers of relationships that need to be in order before you even get to the place where you're in a relationship with another person and then moving from there. And so we're, we're going to discuss and go back and forth on three of these amazing tiers. The first being the, that there, before you can talk about a relationship with someone or a marriage with someone, you have to have your relationship with God. And so we, we will start there and, and make our way from from that point and so yeah as, as we talked about it we realized that even with with our marriage you know without the relationship with god portion in place i can't even say that we would have fallen apart i don't know that we would have ever gotten together you know <laughs> without without establishing not only in an individual relationship with God, but then when we came together as husband and wife, it became what is our relationship with God together like, which is a whole other thing as well. And so uh, I'll let you start. And, and I do this because it, <laughs> Tina's relationship with God is one of the purest things I've ever seen. And so it, I can't think of a better person to speak to it in terms of the ins and outs and, and just offering a nice pure perspective of what it's like to have a real one-on-one -on -one with God. So please take it away. Sure. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we, we decided on the name hashtag relationship goals because, you know, we spend time on social media, not too much time, but enough to see that um, people are focusing on one of God's gifts to us because it's something that we all need. Like God gave us a relationship. Um, he gave us relationship with him through his son, Jesus, and so if you look on Instagram and see what folks are posting under hashtag relationship goals, it doesn't look like, hey, how do I relate to, to God through his son Christ? And it doesn't look like, how do I relate to myself? And how honest am I with myself so I can be intimate with God? And so tonight, you know, he gave the, the background for it, which is very true. Um, but we really want to dig into what happens in your own time, what stories are you telling yourself? What habits are you are you practicing? Um, how are you relating to the people you encounter every single day? You know, in in passing, are you kinder to, you know, a stranger than you are to your own husband, or are you honoring people who are in authority over you, but not those who you think are in submission to you? So we wanted to look at at how we relate to each other. Um, and I, I wanted to actually start with a passage of scripture. Um, we'll go to 1 John, uh, the beginning of the, the verse I gave you. I think there's 19, 13, 13. Yes. That's exactly it. There it is. <laughs> it's easy to remember. Um, so this is, and if you haven't read the Bible, I encourage you to read it cover to cover. Um, this is sort of the most famous part of the Bible where Jesus calls out the traitor in his midst. And I wanted to, to read through this for context because um, in relationship, we, we focus on the romance of it and we focus on the, you know, quote unquote goal of love and marriage. And that's, that's not really the goal. That's the overflow. And so if you if you start there, what'll end up happening is 
working backwards from it, everything you do until you get married will be perverted and kind of twisted to try to force that outcome. And it can hurt you, it can hurt the people in your life, it can destroy your marriage, it can create generational curses. The stuff is bad. <laughs> like, so we really want to make sure that um, from beginning to end, we're, we're whole. Um, and so this is the best example I can think of. It has nothing to do with romance or, you know, love in the the male female you know romantic sense this is Jesus and all of his homies and he is about to demonstrate and and to walk them through the fact that he is demonstrating to them what not only love should look like but what service should look like and and that's sort of a root of relationship which we'll talk about but um He's going to show them what service looks like. So we're going to run through these really quickly. Um, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. And, and this is Jesus speaking in scripture. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. So not only is he washing feet, and I'm going to unpack it quickly and then kind of bring the conversation part along, but we were earlier tonight, <laughs> Ebenezer was like, yo, not only was he washing their feet, but just the lead-in to how he prepared to do this, Jesus stripped down, then put on basically like a towel to cover himself, and then proceeded to wash them like basically butt naked, but with a towel on. And he was, he was washing their feet with the towel that he was wearing, which is, I don't know about you all, but that is the most humbling posture you could possibly be in. So he's at his servant's feet, he's kneeling before them, and he's, he's washing their feet. And these aren't like they were all wearing Uggs and they were walking on, on asphalt. They were running around barefoot in the dirt. <laughs> so this was, you know, a, a humbling act to perform. And as you saw throughout the passage, he points out that he knows someone has betrayed him and that he's telling them that now so that they can be clear on the fact that he's acting with that knowledge in mind as he's serving them. So with the awareness of a traitor, with the awareness of someone who is in your enemy, that's still the way that you serve, is, is in humility and with complete vulnerability and exposure. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything you want to add there. I'm trying not to go f fully into like every word of this passage. Don't let me interrupt you. <laughs> um, and then also talking about servant leadership. Um, we're in a place right now where unfortunately a lot of our leaders are doing the opposite of servant leadership. And servant leadership is the idea that you lead from uh, within, that you support and that you bring out the best in people, and that the way that you lead creates a fruit. It creates a, a manifestation of the heart of your leadership that demonstrates goodness and greatness and God. And what we're seeing instead a lot of the times is leadership that leads from in front and kind of coerces and cajoles and influences you into their way of thinking. And the fruit of that is ungodly. Manipulation is completely ungodly, and we don't have to get too specific, but the greatest power he's given us is choice. It's free will. And so servant leadership by supporting allows us to exercise our will and to exercise our free choice. So relationship always has to come from that place. And that's what Jesus did. Like, honestly, if you put me circa like 2001 in this position with 12 people I considered to be my like servants or people who reported to me, 
<laughs> first of all, I didn't know God until 2010, first of all, for context. So the, the outcome of this probably would have been radically different. I mean, for Jesus to know someone was going to betray him, there was no manipulation in how he laid this out. There was no coercion. There was no, okay, guys, we're going to gather together and, and chase this guy down and murder him. It was simply... Let me use this opportunity to show you how to love on one another for eternity. That's relationship. Uh, and it's the, the context of this and another passage or the, the context for how we want to talk about what hashtag relationship goals should be, <laughs> right? And um, I know I didn't give this to, to the media team. Is there any way to pull up, uh, let's see, John 13. Can we go to verse nine, same chapter, if that's possible. There's, there's a specific verse that I'm thinking of um, where it speaks of, as this is beginning, Jesus speaks of how he basically, and you touched on it, knew what was going to happen. And what allows ultimately for the, the greatest service is when you have gone into the situation with a notion from God for what needs to be done. Uh, Lord, oh, it's going to be here. I guess it's earlier than that. Let's go. Let's start with verse one. Thank you guys so much. And then we're going to go all the way through Revelation and then back to Genesis. And I think we'll find it sometime. We'll be out by 1030. Sometime, right. Sometime before the parking lot's closed. Uh, <laughs> but it was, it was amazing because for Jesus to know that he was going to be betrayed, mind you, it says that he washed all of their feet. He washed Judas's feet, knowing what was going to happen. But what enabled him to do it was he knew from the beginning what was going to take place. And the reason he knew was because he had such a close relationship with the father that he walked into this situation informed. And I think if we're going to improve relationships in general, but specifically uh, relationship with each other, we have to become more adept, because it's not an easy thing, but it's our challenge to become more adept at looking at encounters, going into en encounters, knowing what God has for us, in store for us in the encounter. I think a lot of times, I won't stop you, sure. <laughs> I think a lot of times we get caught in uh, back and forths that we never planned. And now we're in a back and forth. I'm not listening. You're not listening. Neither one, neither one of us has an objective. We're just bantering. It's just going back and forth and emotions are getting involved and now we're heated. And all of a sudden the entire point of the encounter ultimately is lost. If we go into every, every conversation we have with the thought process, what, does, what is God's desired outcome for this exchange? I think it not only changes what's going to take place, it changes us. Because the way, we, the way we speak and the way we receive becomes completely different from that point. And that change is noticed by someone else who's speaking to you too, because they can look and they say, well, wait a minute, this person I'm talking to is actually listening to what I'm saying. And that's how we create relationship. We have to relate. We've lost the, the art, because it is an art form. It's not easy, especially not easy to relate to people you don't agree with. But if we're ultimately seeking the Christ purpose for every encounter, we have to always be searching for how do we establish relationship in this exchange. So I actually wanted to ask you a question that sure. put you kind of on the spot, but not really. Um, <laughs> Hmm, how can I say this? So, as I said earlier, one, Tina has one of the purest relationships with God I've ever seen, especially because, as she said in 2010, both of us in 2010 is when we came to know the Lord. And so, for you, hmm, how can I say this? What was, or if there was, was there one particular exchange which allowed you to say, oh yeah, this is me and you, God. Because a lot of times when we talk about having a relationship with God, let's be real. Somebody right now is like, what does that mean? Like, does that mean I 
I turn off the lights and sit in a corner? Do I go to the park? What does that mean? And so for you, what were the steps for you to establishing a relationship with God? That's fun. <clears throat> so here comes story time with Tina. <laughs> um, the, the first step was literally that. It was a step. It was in a building that happened to be uh, a one church facility. And the pastor that day uh, spoke in a way and the spirit in the house that day was such that for me, who like not only did I not know God, I had made up my own gospel of confusion that I was following. It was a mess. And the spirit of the house that day brought the truth of Christ to my heart. And so I, I opened up to receive that in the building first for me. And then there were two other encounters that um, really deepened my relationship with him. One was when you actually had the health scare in, was that 2012? Yeah. So this guy, and stand up, honey, please, just really quickly. I love you. I love you. Just really I, I quickly. guess I put her on the spot, so okay. This is a fit gentleman, yes. <laughs> He's fit. Okay, you can sit back okay. down. That's all. Okay, that's all. thank that's you, all. thank you. It was a quick demonstration. <laughs> So the health scare that he had was um, a sudden onset of multiple blood clots in his lungs, pulmonary embolisms. And usually the way that that forms is because someone's obese or they live a sedentary lifestyle, which is why I was demonstrating. I okay. No, I was with you. I got you. Um, uh, th that's usually the cause of it. And it came out of nowhere. It disappeared out of nowhere. And throughout the process, um, I was fearful for his life. And I mean, with good reason. This was the kind of thing where I felt like I was on a house episode and the doctors were looking at his chart and he's sitting right here and with no bedside manner, they're saying, this is, this is you? This is your chart? And he's like, yes. And they're like, you're still alive. And he's like, are, why are you saying that to me? That's not comforting. And then they, you know, and this was multiple doctors would say, you know, usually with this kind of condition, it causes sudden death. So you're still here, so that's good. And that was really all they could offer. Um, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So the encounter I had uh, was that it, you know, he was passed out on a bed on meds, um, long story short. And what I realized as I was trying to speak to God and I was trying to like get into that one church feel, you know, because I was going regularly. I think this was two years after I had, had met God. So I, I was trying to tap into the power that I knew existed, but I didn't really have the faith drawn out of me yet. A circumstance had to draw it out of me. And so for him, I had to, for one, recognize very quickly and accept that I had been sort of living vicariously through his spirituality and his relationship with God and through my pastor's relationship with God. And in the moment, and, and the circumstance was that I was literally in a car driving behind the ambulance that had him in it to a different hospital than the first one we went to. And something rose up in me and it was a, a cry out for God that demanded he work. And, and that just continued and eventually, you know, we found out that he was miraculously healed and he's still here. <laughs> Yeah, what she said. Uh, I, I want to move into the uh, the next segment, and we we may return as into uh, to the relationship portion with God, but I, I think the next part of establishing overall relationship for all of us is you know once you have that relationship with God, now comes the relationship with yourself, and. I wanted to make sure, as we talked about it, there's an order to it. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have the relationship with God first, you can't receive the revelation of who you really are to establish a, a fulfilling and true relationship to begin with. I think a lot of times, because it's one of the most vulnerable things you can do, to be honest, is to, is to open up to God and say, have your way. I know PT has spoken 
numerous times about how God is the master surgeon and how once you open up, he can look inside and just fix all that is wrong, but it takes the opening up process to even get to that point. And so it is not only vulnerable, it's just scary beyond measure to open, your up, you open yourself up to the King of Kings and say, have your way. And so because that's so scary, sometimes we'll skip it and we'll just have conversations with ourselves. And say, well, I can fix this myself. And that's because establishing the relationship that she's talking about with God requires an honesty and a vulnerability and a depth that is easy to skip over if you just have conversations with yourself. And so I really wanna, I wanna move to the next portion, which is, yeah, establishing a relationship with yourself. Uh, would you like to or should I? Please. I will, okay. <laughs> I, I, I know for me, the relationship with myself after my relationship with God was so different because one of the things I had to get comfortable with doing was getting to know my ugly and, and not freaking out. Because once, once God opens your eyes to the supernatural possibilities of who he is, and you recognize that he can literally heal you from anything, I, like as she shared the story, I understood it on a physical level. But the spiritual healing that God can do is so mind-blowing that it can be a little scary. And so for me, I now had to, I had to wrestle with and get to a place where I became comfortable with God showing me things about myself that I didn't like and that I thought were a part, a permanent part of who I was. And so one of the keys to really establishing a relationship with self is constantly coming to the understanding that God is perfecting us every second of every minute of every day. He's perfecting you, he's perfecting you, he's perfecting you. I think it's so hard because once we discover something about us that ain't right, we go, oh, I thought I fixed this. I thought I was done with the fixing. I'm just, I'm right now, I'm feeling good, I'm feeling great. And then there's that discovery of ooh. And especially if ooh is something that you've become accustomed to. And so one of the brilliant ways God was able to do this with me was through her. Because as you get to know my wife better, you will find that she is truth. <laughs> She will deliver the uncut, laser, raw truth with a smile, filled with the love of Jesus, amen. But it's truth. And so with our relationship before we got married, one of the interesting things about being in a really deep, deep relationship with someone else, and this is the way I, I like to describe it, is at some point you look in their eyes and you see your reflection. And when you see your reflection, your real reflection, everything is not always cool. And you know, up until that point, I had lived by myself. And when you live by yourself, there really is no reflection. So whatever you do is cool. It's all good. <laughs> your bad habits are your bad habits. You deal with them. It's no big thing. You leave towels on the floor, who cares? You'll pick them up later. It's all right. You know, and so living by yourself has its own interesting uh, dynamic in itself. But once you come to a place where you are in relationship with someone and the things that you do have an effect on more than yourself, it causes the beginnings of self-discovery. And so I had to figure out I had a lot of bad habits and it wasn't until I realized what I could possibly lose because of those bad habits that I had to then take them to God and say, God, this has to go. And I mean, really has to go. Because let's be honest, sometimes you have that got to go, but you don't really want it to go. You just know you're supposed to say it's got to go. 
<laughs> like that's in the script when you find out something bad about yourself you're like oh page nine this is the part where I say this has to go <laughs> and then you just go into the prayer closet and you say God this has to go <laughs> it's not going oh, okay guess I tried and just walk out of the closet but once the ramifications start to be put forward I had to face for me the the ramifications were possibly losing her and what was scary was this was before I was even beginning to realize the fullness of just the potential of what me and this woman were gonna have for a life so I think back on it now and I'm like that's why I said earlier if not for my relationship with God wouldn't be married I tell you flat out, I pro I'm, I'm about 99.999% sure we, we wouldn't be married. And that 1% is if we were married, it wouldn't last. We'd be done by now. I would have done well beyond stupid things uh, <laughs> to have made things wrong. Uh, let's just be specific. I'm not going to play with the generalities. We're family. Let's talk for real. So... <laughs> If you've heard me speak about this before, one of, the, one, of the, one of the funniest things about God, I love to say God has the best sense of humor, is one of the first things I had to get over about myself was my eyes. I had a bad eye problem. And by eyes, I mean specifically my eyes and how I looked at women. And so it was bad. But what was crazy was I didn't realize how bad it was because it didn't affect me. And so my eyes would just travel wherever they wanted to go. <laughs> and it was no big deal. You're just looking, right? <laughs> just looking, no big deal. Until you find yourself looking at the reflection of who you are through someone whose relationship is being damaged by the wandering eyes. So now I got a problem because these eyes have to go. And what was I, like 33? How old was I? I was, I was in my 30s. So for 20 some odd years, these eyes have been mine. They look where they want to look and that's just being a man and that's just, I can't help myself and blah, 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 blah. Every excuse I could think of, I had them. Until finally it was like, this has to go because either I'm just going to be searching to and fro for the rest of my life or I'm going to settle into the promise of what God has for me. Whenever that's the beginning of the of the relationship with self after you've established the relationship with God. Mm -hmm. At some point he reveals something about you that you don't like and on top of that you have a choice. Because I promise, if you keep that thing, it will cost you. You don't know if it'll cost you now. Might not be this week. Might not be this, might not even be this season. Eight years can go by and you're just thinking you're sailing on by. And then right there will come the situation where you should have given this thing up or this part of you that you kept that needed to be changed wasn't changed and now it is damaging the promise that God has brought you to the door of <laughs> and so for me the big relationship first because there have been so many more since then uh, was dealing with my eyes and in particular my attitude towards women and understanding that my thinking was wrong and there was something in my spirit that was wrong once I had this, I needed a revelation. Because it's one thing to say, I need the change. But if you don't understand the full root of the thing, then you're just changing for change's sake. And that, won't, that doesn't last either. And so I had to get an understanding. And I got this through the word, which was basically what you look at. I, mean, I know everybody says, the eyes are the windows to the soul. That's so poetic and beautiful. I love that. But here's the thing, what you look at, what you meditate on, is what you become. And so, as a man, if, all, if my eyes are just meditating on different woman after different woman after different woman after different woman after different woman, 
All I'm becoming is these hypothetical possibilities of this woman and that woman and this other woman. Meanwhile, God has promised me a woman who has a name, who has an identity and a purpose that is in alignment with all of who God has called me to be. And instead of meditating on that so that I can become the fullness, I'm meditating and just looking to and fro. I'm distracted. I'm literally le living a life of distraction. And so that was the first of the, of the, of the relationship self moments where I had to say, God, this, this has to go. And once that happened, and he delivered me from that, it, it, I, have to, I gotta be honest, it becomes a little bit easier to say, okay, here's another wart about me. God, I need you to handle this. Knowing that it is a co-laboring I think a lot of times we say, God, deliver me from this, and we literally expect God to do all of the work. That's not a relationship. There's no one-sided relationship where one person does all the work and the other person just sits there and, and benefits. That doesn't work. That's not relationship. And so one of the key components also is to not only say, God, deal with this, but then be like, God, what is my work? Where, what is my labor in this? What is it that I need to do? What is it that I need to change? Do I need to change my environment? Do I need to change my habits? Do I need to change the people around me? Do I need to change all of it? Do I need to change whatever change that needs to take place? It has to come from God. And once we get into the habit of doing this continuously over and over and over and over, we don't get freaked out anymore by our imperfections or our ugly because we're in relationship with God and we're in relationship with ourselves. And once you can draw that sort of triangle, oh man, the sky's the limit with who you can become and, and how you can walk in purpose and be free in it. And, and when I say free, I mean free as in not feeling like you have to be perfect all of the time because that's bondage of its own. The, the bondage of perfection is a, a word. I might do that next Wednesday. We'll figure that out. But the only way you can be delivered from feeling like you have to be perfect in, in order to move forward is understanding that God, literally God is like, bring it to me. Bring that thing right there in your chest. Bring it to me. I got this. I can, I can fix that. We can fix this. Just bring it to me. Bring it to me. I know it hurts. Just bring it to me. It will feel so much better after you bring it. Just bring it. Bring it right here. Bring it to me. Speak it. Talk about it. Talk about it. Just bring it to me. And I promise you, you will overcome this. That's the relationship with self that, that, that I'm after for all of us. And so, yeah, please add to that. I saw the mic go up. You were ready. I'm chomping at the bit. Um, well, first of all, and this is something that you've taught me, are still teaching me as of, I think, last night, is take nothing personally. Mm. Mm. So the particular, you know, wart, as you called it, that he described, how many of us know that in a relationship, uh, a committed monogamous relationship, the most important thing to you is feeling like you're the apple of that person's eye? Right? And how easy would it have been for this to all of a sudden become about me and how worthless and etc. and this whole big mess and now his issue is everybody's issue. Not to mention, we happen to have, well he ain't in here now, but we have a son <laughs> who's 10 months old now and I'm so proud that he can grow up under you because we learn by example. So right now, not only is that kid learning how to walk and talk and eat and make weird noises, he's learning how to treat women because of how my husband does. And so, as you described that it may not, it may not cost you 
next month or eight years from now, it might not cost you at all. It might cost the next generation. Jesus. There are kids that are growing up watching their parents live through brokenness because they can't be honest with themselves and they can't take their problems to God. And those children grow up and manifest the exact same issues. And it doesn't take a, a sitting down and talking to like this. All it takes is you watching, you know, watching your mom do something over and over and over again. And because we naturally glorify our parents, we naturally depend on them because they create a safe space for us, just like our Father in Heaven does, we, we try to emulate them. And if they're not mirroring behavior to us that's healthy, then that becomes manifest in the future. So the other thing that stood out as you were talking was um, that there's a safe space that's created. Relationships, first and foremost, have to be safe. And so when you take, when you trust God enough and when you have faith in him enough to believe that him giving his son to die for our sins creates the ultimate safe space. You can trust him with anything. The first time you do it, it's a confirmation that it really was safe, that it's really going to be okay. And the next time you do that, out in the natural with someone in relationship, you teach them that you're safe, that they can tell you whatever their problems are, that they can bring disagreements to you, that they can share their pain, that they can depend on you because you're not going to take it and a week later throw it back in their face or make a joke about it or find a way to manipulate it for your good because you're broken. So there's a safety that we have to learn to create in our relationships with each other that really only comes from knowing you're safe with your father first. Yep. And you can work all that stuff out up here and then be safe for the people around you also. So. Yeah. yeah. No, that, that's, I'm so glad that you, that you touched on that, is the, the safety thing is so important. And, and, it, and I think it becomes a criteria that we need to maintain for all of our relationships, is that should, be, that should be criteria like number one, like how safe do I feel with you? Yeah. Yeah. Like can I really express my thoughts to you knowing that there's not going to be judgment or condemnation even if there's disagreement? Can I share my thoughts with you? Because if I can't, well, now you need to be an acquaintance. Exactly. You know, and that's fine. Listen, you know, you will have acquaintances, you know, for as long as you live. But once we're talking about relationship in particular, you know, as your circles get closer and closer and closer and closer, that safety issue is big. And, and, and recognizing that real talk, some people are dangerous. Mm -hmm. And some people aren't dangerous until they get super close to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and we don't realize it. They look real safe, you know, where they are. But, you know, once we start to get into that inner, inner circle, all of, the, all of the dangerous heart posture that they have as the conversations become more intimate, mm -hmm. reveal itself, and they start to work against you, and they start to attack you that's when you have to step back and reevaluate the whole thing. And that, by the way, is a safe thing to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Make sure no one ever backs you into a relationship corner yeah. Yeah. where you, you know, there was a distance and then as you've had interactions, that, in, that distance is closed, so you guys have, have become kind of cool or really cool, and if, you know, if somebody says something foul, you have all of the right and authority to back up and say, whoa, I need to, I need to put you in the corner. <laughs> and, and it's not necessarily, you don't need to explain it, you need to evaluate it and say, all right, that thing that just happened, I have a funny rule, it, I hope this works. For me, one is an incident, two is a coincidence. Three's a pattern. I try not to get past one. I do my best. Because once we get to doing three, I'm a pretty patient dude. You're so patient. 
by, <laughs> by three, I'm like, uh-uh. At this point, I can't even blame you. I'm looking at myself. <laughs> well, by the time we get to pattern, it's me. I allowed this to happen. So now I need to fix myself before I get anywhere near you. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for that. You're welcome. You just touched on boundaries, which you know is my favorite <laughs> word. Boundaries! <laughs> um, so, I mean, everything we're talking about tonight is about maturity. It's about relational maturity. It's not, you know, how do I get a boo? Or, you know, how do I... <laughs> <laughs> make friends and influence people <laughs> it's it's how do we get whole and so for me um, my upbringing meant that when I turned whatever it was I think 30 or so um, I had some clarity through God about how broken I was about how broken the habits um, I had developed emotionally were and so I came from a big family and I had developed over years and years and years of time the habit of emotionally manipulating my way into getting affection. And affection is a basic need. You know, we, kids need to be loved and held. It helps make you feel safe. It's a basic physical need, but when it's not met healthily, you've got problems. And so for me, instead of saying, hey, give me a hug, which I will do now. I will demand my hugs. I'm a <laughs> hugger. <laughs> Instead of saying that or saying, hey, can I snuggle with you, mom? Or hey, can I hold your hand? I would put on this big cloud like Eeyore, and I would slink back into my little space and wait to see who noticed. And if no one noticed, I would like... <laughs> So I'm throwing this little like temper tantrum because I think deep down I knew it was unhealthy and I wanted to find a way uh, to, to get the affection that was healthy, but I couldn't figure it out. You know, I was young, I was young. So I, I tried to throw this little temper tantrum and see who would say, oh, what's wrong? And now they're paying attention to me and now I can say, it's, you know, I just feel so bad. And now I've got the hug I wanted, right? And so what can happen when you're all grown up, and this is something that he helped deliver me from, because at the end of the day, m marriage helps to show you your imperfections, but again, it's overflow. So all the people that, I mean, the guy sitting next to you in your seat right now, if you can't figure out how to negotiate a parking space he took from you, <laughs> you're not gonna be able to figure out how to bring things to God that are broken in you. Um, you'll be in so much conflict within yourself that you won't even face what needs to be fixed and then you can't bring it to him. So what was happening with me emotionally in our relationship was, thank God he's patient because I probably gave you all the coincidences and patterns and what have you and by the grace of God he was patient with me. Um, but when we first started dating, I know I'm, I'm rambling, but it'll, it'll make sense in a moment. When we were first dating, I was gathering information about this guy. I was like, okay, asking questions and, and paying attention to the answers and observing his mannerisms and behaviors. I filed away the fact that this dude volunteered at a YMCA changing baby diapers for a whole summer. I was like, hashtag father. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> So one of the bits of data I collected was, I asked him, how did your previous relationships end? Uh-oh. Yeah. Well, what he said that, that came back to haunt me later, I was like, oh my gosh, that's why. He said that uh, he heard a consistent complaint that he didn't uh, seem to care enough. He didn't react enough. He's laughing. All y'all who get it are laughing. <laughs> what was happening was, and this is where it came back to me, is that I learned over the years that I had taken that little girl thing that I did of trying to get affection, and I was using it to try to win his affection. So I would throw these little emotional temper tantrums, and they're fine if you're having them on your own. Go to have them somewhere in private. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you're ready to talk about it like an adult, 
clear-headed, you know, emotion-free, have your emotional temper tantrums in private. But I would have them not only in front of him, but I would demand spiritually that he engage. And I didn't even realize it. So I wasn't just, oh, I'm so sad. It was, and you need to do something about it. So now we're in, we could have been, in this spiritual tug of war where he's being manipulated by my brokenness. And thank God he takes nothing personally. I'd be like, oh my gosh, I just feel blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's sitting there exactly like this. <laughs> and he'll, that's when he drops his head at you, that's a... Um, <laughs> Go tell on me, babe. Wow. <laughs> and then if things really got bad, he'd repeat back to me what I said to him and then just look at me. So you're mad because you got up late and you were late to work and you missed a meeting and they docked your pay and I didn't pick you up on time and <laughs> but we joke now, like, use your words, figure out how to talk about what's wrong, you know, and we joke with the baby, like, use your words, you're such a baby. <laughs> but we do that to each other, and we take the passion we feel about social issues, and we take the passion we feel about our pain, and we're not just sharing, we're not just testifying, we want to hook you with it. You know, we demand a response or a reaction, and that's manipulation. It's not of God. And it's spiritual immaturity, and it, it flies against the greatest power he gave us of free will. It's why we mess everything up. <laughs> he trusts us enough to let us choose, because he could have done it differently. But he lets us choose. And so in all of our relationships, at the core of it, the safe space is, I'm allowing you to choose. The servant leadership is, I'm allowing you to choose. And so that has to be at the core of it. If you feel backed up against a relationship wall, somebody snatched your choice away from you, you know? And, and just to, to, to touch on something that she mentioned too, I want to make sure that we clarify that there is a difference between boundaries and barriers those are two different things all hope I say this right all barriers are boundaries not all boundaries are barriers barriers literally keep people out and that is the antithesis of relationship so while you want to make sure you have boundaries, which are areas that are marked off, that are lines, that are, de that, that are drawn in the sand, you don't want to build up walls that are keeping people out. Those are two different things. I want to quickly clarify all that rambling I did was to clarify a boundary he set, which can be as simple as... <laughs> That'll be a boundary. It sends the message. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, no problem. And, and one of the things I wanted to make sure that, that we clarified too was, for me, that was, as she put it, a boundary. But it was not a barrier. It was not something I was going to use to keep a wedge between us. But there was a boundary for me that there was this particular behavior that I was not going to accept. What then needs to happen if we're speaking truthfully about how relationship works is the honest conversation about it. And why I love her so much was because at some point she saw that I wasn't reacting and we had to really just have it. And it happened a few times before we, kind of, we had to get to an understanding of what is this thing? Like, no, really, what is this? And what is it beyond just, I do this, and this is how you feel, and then this happens? What is the root of this? And it's, it is so, uh, it's so crucial to a relationship to be able to do that part. It's one thing to have the understanding of what a thing is. It's another to be able to communicate about it with a person that you are in relationship with whether it is your wife, your spouse, your friend, your brother, your mother, your, whoever it is that you are in that kind of relationship with, it's a whole other thing to be able to communicate this and then say, what can we do so that I can move forward and I can be delivered from this? Mm -hmm. 
And that's really where we start to establish the true nature of, of relationship, bridging to the, the third part of our conversation. So we talked about relationship with God being first and foremost. And you establish that relationship with God, and you work that relationship with God, and then as he reveals who you are and your identity, you start to now forge a relationship with yourself. And it's a relationship built on truth, it's a relationship built on the connection that you have with God and all the things he said about you and keeping them and not letting anyone take them away from you. And, and you, as you become strengthened in that relationship with self, you get to the third part, which is the relationship with others. And especially now, what I've seen in terms of the divisive nature of things that have taken place in terms of the presidential election and, and parties and all this other stuff, I've, it, it's, so, it's so wild to see the deterioration in relationship to others. Especially because be, we have this social media tool which in theory is supposed to bring us together it's supposed to make it easier to communicate with each other i should be able to speak my thoughts and you speak your thoughts and and yet somehow it has been it is it has been used as a re, in a reactionary way to split and to and to divide and to put distance between and so it's weird to think that we actually probably relate to each other less. I mean, we had, there was a time where, you know, if you wanted to talk to somebody, you picked up the phone and you called them. And that was the only way you were going to talk to that person. That is the only way you were going to find out how they were doing. That's the only way you were going to, you know, invite them to your birthday party. That was it. If you didn't make that phone call, or write a letter, which you know we don't do anymore. It wasn't gonna happen. Nowadays, in terms of relating to other people, you know, if, if I wanna know how such and such is doing, I scroll through their timeline. There's no actual contact. I just click on the name, scroll through the contact. Oh, okay, uh, they got married, great. Honeymoon was here, cool. <laughs> They're back now, all right. Oh, they having a baby? Well, they got to work quick. Okay, uh, <laughs> there's the registry, click, send a gift, boom. I haven't had a conversation. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm caught up in all of their business. Mm -hmm. And if someone wants to get caught up on all of my business, you just click on my name and you scroll through, oh, vacation here, uh, audition there, and marriage here, and the baby's here, and oh, the baby's growing, the baby has two teeth, the baby's, but we've never had a conversation. That is the world we live in right now. And I think because we have become so accustomed to that style and system of communication, we're deteriorating at relationship to other people. Mm -hmm. Because that platform sets up a conversation where you can say what you want with no ramifications. Mm -hmm. You can just air your thoughts out and just say it. And you don't have to deal with the person's emotional reaction. You don't have to deal with any of it if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to engage in a nine to 10 reply deal, that's up to you. But there's a difference between saying something, for lack of better words, snarky on, on, a, on Instagram or Facebook versus calling somebody mm -hmm. and being on a phone with that person and saying that same thing to them mm -hmm. on the phone or going and knocking on their door and, and sitting in Starbucks together face to face mm -hmm. and saying that same snarky thing. Mm -hmm. And so our relationships to other people are eroding. And so tonight I, I wanna make sure that we start to build those things back up. And I think it starts with the foundation being what is your relationship with God? From that point, what is your relationship with yourself? Because if you're open and honest with God, you're open and honest with yourself. Now you've opened up, you've started a habit of communicating which says, I need to get to the truth. And I need to get to that truth from a place of love. And for me, one of the master communicators in the word was Paul. I love reading about Paul and his letters because Paul would get sent to these places and he would have to deliver the word and all types of stuff was happening in these churches. 
and he would have to go knowing who he was and he would still have to speak to these people in a way that didn't get him killed but he still communicated truth and as you read more and more about him I, I tell everyone study Paul read all of his letters because every single city he went to every town that he went to had a completely different circumstance and he would start by speaking to them according to their circumstances yeah. every place he went to so I hear your church has a problem with lust let's talk about that I love you I love I think you guys are wonderful what you're doing is great you've done this you've done this you've done this you've done this met the improvement Whoa! I've seen growth in you guys but you got this one thing right here <laughs> and we're gonna talk about he was a master and so as you study him you're like well what is it about Paul that allowed him to be sent to these places and to communicate this way so I want to go to 1 Corinthians uh, 9, I believe it is. And he's speaking in the, in the province of Corinth. And he just breaks down who he is. And I want to make sure that, that we can take this with us into all of our, our interactions and our relationships with other people. He says, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant. Can we all say servant? Servant. Woo! I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. I'm going to go through the whole thing and then pick some parts. Because I get so excited about Paul. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law. Not being without law toward God, but under law towards Christ. Now that distinction is huge. I will pause there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just because you understand where someone is coming from doesn't mean you got to be that person and take on their habits, take on their lifestyle, and take on their stance. All this really is saying is, I understand where you're coming from. You can understand where someone is coming from without having to go where they are. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law towards Christ, that I might win those who are without law. Keep going. To the weak I became as weak, oh, that I might win the weak. So many of us are afraid to be weak. Yeah. Because we're afraid of being taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. I've read that passage I don't know how many times. Just recently I caught that end. Now I do this for the gospel's sake that I may be a partaker of it with you. Can we go back to 22? I love 23 too. To the weak I become as weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. In our relationships with other people, I'll say this as plainly as possible, you're not gonna win everybody. If there's one thing I pray as believers we get delivered from is this idea that every conversation I have, I've gotta win every single person I speak to. That is not the case and it says so right there. I have become all things to all men, meaning you understood, you put forth the effort, you shaped your heart into the posture which says, I'm going to relate to this person and I'm going to do my best to understand their perspective, no matter who it is, that I might by all means save some, knowing I'm not going to get everybody. Because if you could get everybody, nobody else would be needed. <laughs> If you get everybody, then I don't need to be here. I don't need to preach. You don't need to preach. We can go home. We got a baby. <laughs> if you got it like that, bet. Send me your number. I'll call you. And you just, I'm just send you out and you just go get everybody. I promise if you go out there trying to get everybody in the spirit of, of I'm going to get everybody, you'll be wore out by 10. 
you'll save 10 people and kill yourself <laughs> in the process. And I can't work with you now because you've worn yourself out and you're mad. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. It is a completely different understanding in, a, in when we're talking about relating to others. When you know going into a relationship and going into an interaction, all I can do is what God has called for me to do in this moment. Yeah. And that is the only realistic expectation that I can have. Yeah. That's a loving place because when you're trying to win with the expectation of winning every single person, when you don't win somebody, devastated. And then from that place comes a little seed of doubt. And now we've got to spend time working out the doubt. And the time you spend working out the doubt, you can't save the person you were supposed to be saving at the time. We have to get delivered from every conversation being, not only am I right, but I'm going to convince you of my point of view no matter what. And I'm going to do this with every single person. That's not what Paul set out to do. Paul set out to become, and, and by becoming, understand the perspective. One of my favorite little graphics, and I do this with her, is with every conversation I have with my wife, I do my very best to do this. <laughs> and by that meaning, I do my best to see myself through her eyes. It takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of patience. But it has saved me from a great deal of drama and stupidity. And by drama, I mean drama that I would have caused because I wasn't paying attention to myself. And stupidity, meaning stupid things I would have done because I still wasn't paying attention to myself. Sometimes as we communicate, we completely don't, we don't even think about what we look like or what we sound like. We're so busy trying to be right, mm -hmm. trying to convince and trying to win that we have stopped understanding. And Yes. Can I add to that? So the other part that maybe you were going to get to is that in seeing himself through my eyes is the idea of empathizing, understanding not only what I'm seeing, but what I'm feeling. And so there's, in every conversation, instead of it being a debate or a convincing process, it's a, what is that? How do you, it seems like you just got sad. What just happened? What did I say? Where, you know, how were you doing yesterday? Are you, are you tired? There's a, a digging to understand the heart posture that comes along with that. So it's not just how do I look, it's, it's how do you feel, you know? And th that is the core of what having relationships with others is about, mm -hmm. is understanding and communication, not just talking and throwing stuff out there and, and, and trying to, oh, moving to the next verse. Could you move to 23, please? Ah, ah. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. He does this for the sake of the good news. I challenge us to enter into every discussion every conversation, every debate, every encounter that we have in our relationships, whether they be acquaintances or more intimate relationships, I challenge us to communicate for the gospel's sake. And that requires a measuring of words that in our microwave society, in our instant speak rapid back and forth society, we've lost the art of. There is a measuring of our words that we have to maintain. Because if we don't, we lose track of the weight of what we say and how it not only affects people, but remember, what we speak into an atmosphere is what is going to be. Mm -hmm. 
So the weight of our words is not just, what does the dictionary say this word mean? Ooh, this person's feelings hurt. I'm literally speaking to the power and the authority of speaking into an atmosphere, mm -hmm. of speaking into the universe, the God-given authority we all have, mm -hmm. and knowing that we can affect that change based on that relationship. So before we fire off that zinger or that snarky remark, we need to understand that once we once our heart posture is not in the place it needs to be in and we start to speak, to a speak from a place where we're not listening and we don't care necessarily for the other person's point of view, we are creating an environment of confusion. Just by speaking it. Because once the person replies to what it is you say, they're gonna reply from that place and now the two of you are just going at it and if there's no wisdom, it's confusion. Now I do this for the gospel's sake that I may be partaker of it with you. Not only are we doing it for the sake of the good news, we're doing it because we are the good news. That I may be partaker of it with you. Every person in this place is a partaker of the good news. So our speech needs to, rep, needs to reflect being a partaker of the good news. Our relationships with other people at the center and core of them need to be that me and this person are partakers of the good news. I think it will change and transform how we view the relationships, not only that we currently have, but the ones we might even be thinking about forming. Mm -hmm. If we look back and we say, God, can I partake of the good news with this person? Mm -hmm. Can I speak in such a way where I am not only reflecting the good news, but now me and this person are both partaking in the good news? Mm -hmm. This exchange is leading to a partaking of the good news. And I think it will, ah, the change that will take place would be amazing. It would be everything that we have all been praying for for the, for the past four, five, six months, if not five, seven, eight, 10, 12 years. Mm -hmm. But if we can literally get into a relationship with people where it is I'm part, I am a partaker of the good news, and I want you to be too. And the heart that it takes to be that vulnerable to say, right now, you're weak. I could be strong right now, but you're weak, and I need to understand where you are. So I'm going to relate to you, and hear you, and listen to you, and minister and I think last week I spoke about what the, the word minister, when you break it down, it means to be an attendant, to tend to. Our conversations need to tend to the needs of the moment. Mm -hmm. And that's how we establish relationships with other people. Mm -hmm. You have meaningful conversations that tend to the needs of moments over and over and over. Every moment you have a conversation, I didn't even know I had that need, and boom, it gets tended to. Those are the meaningful relationships we should be able to, we should be looking at. Do you want to add to that at all? Uh, really quickly, Go for it. I wanted to um, share a dream that I had um, years ago that speaks to the core of relationship and how that um, affects change. So in this dream, I was uh, in a it was a nightscape and I was standing on the edge of a coastline and in the distance was a city, the uh, sort of silhouette of a, a skyline in the distance. And I saw in the night I w a huge red flashing light, you know, come down from the sky and have impact on this city and it was like a sonic boom. There was an explosion. And I realized there were other people standing near me watching this and everyone sort of freaked out. And I, you know, we all went back to our respective places to sleep. And in the morning when I came out to sort of, you know, survey the kind of apocalyptic damage that had been done, I saw in the same place where I was um, a man standing. 
And as I looked at him, I looked up and saw a blimp that was so huge it kind of covered the sky and it looked like a nuclear warhead. It was moving really slowly. And I, I looked at that thing and I was trying to make sense of it and then I looked at this you know, person in front of me, he had his back to me. And as I walked closer to this man, I saw that he was holding a control box. And it all sort of came crystal clear that this one person held the controls to something that was causing destruction. And it, in the moment, was the realization that each one of us makes up the global population collectively. And so if we, if we focus only on our own problems or only on uh, you know, what we want our outcomes to be, we miss it. In that dream, what I realized was, wow, if I could reach that man, I could change what was going to happen. I was looking up and seeing this huge, you know, nuclear warhead thing that was steel, and I was like, well, how could I take that out of the sky? What could I do? And I realized that wasn't the answer. The answer was in this person's decisions. And that's the approach that we have to take to our relationships, is that if we could get that interconnectivity right, if we could heal each other, if we could learn from each other and figure out how to really speak to one another and understand, that's where change happens. And it's each of our responsibility to carry that out every day. So. And I think we're gonna we're gonna close there. Uh, so that 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 was where we <laughs> that was our conversation in the car <laughs> after uh, our relationship panel. And I just want everybody to 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 make sure we take those three steps with us: relationship with God first and foremost, relationship with with self, and then radiating outward, I think that's where we achieve ultimately the ideal relationship with others that God has called for us to have. Let's stand. It's hard to speak about a relationship and not know when it's time to begin one. I want to speak to the people who are here who, if you know, you have not begun that relationship with God yet. If you have not started that open and honest relationship with God yet, and you want to start tonight, come on down. Let's seal that into the atmosphere. Come on down. If you want to start that open relationship with God, because you know you need that open relationship with yourself, because that will cause you to have real relationships with others, come on down. Come on down. Come on down. Yeah, come on down. Relationship building starts here tonight. Come on down. <clears throat> if you've been curating the way you look at yourself, the way you curate your Facebook timeline, if you've been picking the parts of you that you like to see and holding on to those and rejecting the parts of yourself that are hard to face, mm. if you've been choosing what to share with God and choosing what to withhold from him because you're scared of what may happen. If you need to know that there is a safe space in him where he can see everything and you can release everything to him, join us here. Please. You can lay that down. Come on. Mm -hmm. Come on. group of people I would like to call down 
I guess this would be yet another one of my challenges. If you know that, mm, mm -hmm. if you know that the relationships that you've had, and this I'm speaking of in terms of relationships with others, if you feel like your relationships with others has not been what God has called for them to be. If you're really honest, you know you got about four or five relationships that God has not spoken over, that God's intent is not being realized in. Come on down. Let's, let's just break that off of you right now. You know, that, you know those relationships shouldn't be there, but you've had them anyway. Come on down. We'll break those right now. It's kind of like breaks with bones. There's some breaks that you have where you have to break the bone in order to reset it and for it to heal. And so let tonight be the night where the breaking is the reestablishing of order where instead of that relationship with that person coming first and then your relationship with yourself and then your relationship with God, let tonight be the night where we flip the entire order around and restore that order the way God intended. Which is your, ooh, that's for somebody. If you know you have a relationship that you have put before God, you know it, you feel it, you know it. And you're afraid that if you put that relationship in its proper perspective, you're going to lose something. Come on down, because let me tell you, whatever you think you're going to lose is nothing compared to what you would gain when you put your relationship with him first. Come on down. Come on. Come on. Come on. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Mm. Mm. On tonight, Heavenly Father, we restore order. We restore order in this house. We restore order in our, our hearts. We restore order in our minds, Lord God, where we put you first. All we want is for you to be glorified, for you to be lifted high. And we know that starts, Father God, with our relationship with you. Knowing, Father God, that every relationship that radiates out from our relationship with you is one that will lift you high and give you glory. I pray from this night forward for everyone who receives this message that Father God, our relationship with you dictates everything from there. Let our relationship with you shape our hearts in such a way that every relationship we have with others is one that not only gives you glory, but is one that is for the sake of the good news. Let our relationships be relationships that speak to the goodness of the good news. Father, right now we cancel all cancerous relationships in the name of Jesus. We break them, we bind them, and we cast them down in the name of Jesus. And Father, we bind anything within us that attracts cancerous relationships. Whatever that thing is, Father God, we expose it to you. We reveal it to you, knowing, Father God, that all you will do is look into our hearts with your love and say, Beloved, you are healed. So Father, this night, we begin a brand new relationship with you.
We start everything from this new relationship with you and we do whatever we need to do, Father God, to refresh and renew our relationship with you every day. And Father, let our speech be changed. Let our hearts be changed and transformed. Let our minds be changed, Lord God. Let nothing but your love, love proceed from our lips, Father God. Where we have been put in the midst of the weak, let us become weak. Let us win hearts knowing, Lord God, that you have placed us in that encounter with the heart to win, knowing that even if we don't win that heart, the whole purpose of that encounter was for our hearts to be right. So right now, Lord God, we reclaim the victory of relationship in order, starting with you and us and everyone from that point. We reclaim the victory of being your people and speaking speaking as if we have such a loving relationship with you that it literally comes out of our, our, our dialogue. Let us reflect you from this night forward, Lord God, in all of our relationships. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>